could sing that every Sunday in Advent. I, I just one of my absolute favourites. I've no idea what some of those verses are talking about, <laughs> but the truth of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about how God is with us, how God came to the earth, what that means for you and I as we, as we struggle with life, but have the good news and the hope that he is there for us and with us and leading us through. So we read from John chapter 3, just two verses. This is, this is Jesus who has met with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, one of the lead teachers of the law, Nicodemus comes at night because he knows that Jesus has something and he wants to know, but he's probably hedging his bets at this point. He doesn't want to be discovered by the rest of the, the, the lawyers, the teachers of the law. And so he comes at night and he comes and he speaks with Jesus. And they're having this whole theological debate and Nicodemus is told, how do you as teacher of Israel not get this? And then Jesus drops this truth bomb on him that has from that point on, from then to today, to the future, until he comes back, has changed lives. And so we read it. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read that. Let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is the good news. That is the good news in two verses. You can, you can whittle it down to verse 16. That is the good news in one verse. That is God's greatest gift to us all, that he gave his only son to save us, to save you, to save me, to save everyone who calls upon his name. And it's, it's, it's become so well known, it's, it's almost a bit of a cliche. We, we have to fight against the words becoming stale. We have to fight against getting used to it. Because we should never get used to that truth of God's love for you and me. And how it changes us. How it changes us internally and eternally as we live for Him. So this morning... We're going to be thinking about how we can give more. Last week we were talking about how we could spend less. Today we're talking about give more. How does that work? Well, hopefully we can navigate our way through it this morning. But first of all, I want to share an awesome joke with you. I know I, know I often have many fantastic, great jokes, but today's is the business. A guy gets shipwrecked and he gets washed up on the beach. The sand is dark red. He can't believe it. The sky is dark red. He walks around a bit and sees that there is dark red grass, dark red birds, and dark red fruit on the dark red trees. He's shocked when he looks at his own skin and he discovers that he is also turning dark red as well. Oh no, he says, I've been marooned. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> What's that guy do the sermon? Well, if I could shoehorn in a, a, an idea, it would be that too often we find ourselves marooned. Not the dark red version, but we find ourselves kind of trapped. In this Advent season of all the stuff that's going on, we kind of feel closed in and pressurized and squeezed and pushed. So much so that we just end up getting on the treadmill, don't we? we? We just get going on it and we think, well, we need to spend money to make people happy. And that is not the case. We have an invitation every Advent to push back against the consumerism, against the overspending, to push back and to rebel against what culture is trying to tell us. If you have kids or you know of people who have kids, or your kids are slightly older, you will have this challenge of navigating how a Christmas tree and all the gifts beneath it and Santa's list relates 
to the story of Jesus, to the good news that Jesus came to the earth. And as Christians, as we try and get time to worship, as we try and get brief glimpses of worship, it's, it's almost like we get to the end of the Advent season and we kind of think, is that it? We get to Christmas Day and we think, is that really all it was? And we hear, I think, God's voice quietly saying, be careful because you're going to miss it. Be careful because if you keep on going this way, you're going to miss the greatest gift of all. So as we're called to rebel, by spending less, it somehow seems right that that is the way we should do it. For the baby born in the manger in poverty, it is right and proper that we should be spending less. But this morning, we're talking about giving more. So is that some sort of contradiction? Well, no. I think what I want to share with you is that we need to give in different ways. So think about your most memorable gift. Think about one Christmas morning, you woke up, and your other half or your kids or your mother and father had given you the gift that just was just you and you've never forgotten it. Have you got it in your mind? Can you, can you picture it? <laughs> Mine, my, my first memorable gift was a distortion pedal. What's a distortion pedal? It was for a guitar. I just started playing the guitar and I'd asked mom and dad if I could get this pedal that made, made my guitar a racket. That's, that's basically what it does, it makes it metal. And that's what I asked for. And mum and dad said, there's no danger. Like that drum kit, there's no way you're getting it. When I woke up that Christmas morning, I think I was about 12, there was a distortion pedal there for me. But it wasn't the actual pedal that made it. It was because mum and dad recognized that this is what I love to do. It was keeping me out of trouble. It was keeping me from vandalizing the telephone boxes. And, and they gave it to me, and, and I was just, it was just memorable. And I've never forgotten that. But to give you a more recent up-to-date version, last year, Sophie had, had spent some time thinking about a gift for, for Donna. And it was a picture of us, and she had, she had carved a bit of wood, and she'd, it's, it's written kind of most memorable memories or something along the top, I can't really remember that bit. But it's a picture of us, and she spent so much time in it, and she gave it to Donna. And, and actually, that's one of the most memorable gifts I think I've ever had, because of the effort and the thought that she put into it. So what I'm trying to say is, the memorable gifts are probably not the necklace off Amazon. It's probably not the phone that someone has, has just said, oh, you want that, there you go. Insert any gift there that you wish that folks have just not spent much time on. You don't remember them because they've not really given you a memorable gift. The best gifts celebrate relationships. They're priceless for so many reasons. It's simple, it's obvious. But when folks take time, and when you take time to give a gift, they're greatly received, and they make a difference. But when we look to God our Father, in these verses, verses 16 and 17, we recognize his heart and his love for the world, and also his holiness. He knew that he had to send his Son to redeem us. Without him, we wouldn't make it. And so he gave his greatest gift. He gave his son. And as he gave, he calls us to give and to love in the same way. So let's think about this word that we, we often throw about at this time of year, incarnation. Now, incarnation, if you've ever had chili con carne, you know that it's all about meat. And incarnation means to make flesh. And when we use the word incarnation, we're saying that Jesus, the infinite Son, came to the earth and he took on flesh. He became one of us. And interestingly, this word is not in scripture anywhere. It doesn't exist in scripture. 
but Scripture is bursting with it. The moment where the divine Son of the Eternal Father enters our story as a human baby. Jesus walked this earth. Only the kind of most strident of atheists would try and deny that Jesus walked on this earth. But the incarnation is more than just a historical fact. The infinite becomes finite. And this truth lies at the Christian heart of the Christian faith. All Christians confess that Jesus is God. Now, if you're, if you're ever in, in discussions with folks like maybe the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, that is a good test. That is a great test of whether or not things are heretical or not. Because if people deny that Jesus is God, then you know they're not part of the Christian faith. That's just a by the by. In that song we just sung this morning, where we talked about the beautiful name, about he who is there at the beginning, we discover in John chapter 1. The Gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the Word. Now John who wrote this Gospel is St. John, best friend of Jesus. It's an eyewitness account. So when John who is given an eyewitness account of his best friend, begins the gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word. And then he goes on to say, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has ever been made. John is telling us that his best friend was not simply a man who walked the earth, but he was there at the beginning. He has made all things. God made all things through him. So he made you and he made me. And he's made this galaxy and the universe. But then in verse 14, in the message version, John tells us that the Word, the Word who was there at the beginning, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. This is the miracle of Christmas. And it continues because through Jesus we see who God is. John 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one. Then John 14 verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So what does this all mean? What does this mean for you and me as we are turning from 2019 to 2020? Well, it means that we can truly know God because he has been revealed in Jesus Christ and it is the most personal gift we can ever have. The incarnation is a game changer. When we come together on a Sunday morning as church gathered together, we celebrate the incarnation. We worship God's rescue plan. N.T. Wright, a New Testament theologian, said these words. Jesus exploded in the life of ancient Israel, not as a teacher of timeless truths or moral example. But by his life, death, and resurrection, God's rescue operation was put into effect. With the incarnation, we see how much God loves you and me and the lengths that he would go to bring us home. I'm I'm a bit of a fan of Snoopy. I I quite like Snoopy and Charlie Brown. I, I like to read the comic strips. And there's one Snoopy comic strip where he is typing a novel. If you know Snoopy, he's always trying to type a novel. And he's, he's writing his novel, and he always starts it the same way. It was a dark and a stormy night. And Lucy, the busybody, comes along, and she begins to give him a tirade. Honestly, Snoopy, that's such a stupid beginning. Don't you know, every story begins with the words, Once upon a time. It then moves to the next frame. Snoopy is back typing his novel, and it says these words. Once upon a time, it was a dark and stormy night. (laughs) It's very easy to feel like Snoopy, isn't it? That it's always dark, it's always stormy, that, that things are always against us. But if you feel that way today, know that you're not alone but know that we've not been left alone. That God comes in and draws near to us in the midst of the storm. 
So, let's think about practicals. Practicals for you and me as we're thinking about how we can share our faith and be lights in the world at this Christmas time. And we look to what God has done in giving his greatest gift and how it affects us. Number one, God at Christmas gave his presence. Not presents, but presents. He gave of himself. Emmanuel, God with us. God with skin on. A face, a voice, a smile, arms to give a hug, a hand to hold. And at Christmas time, there are people who need your presence. And you need their presence. We are very well connected, aren't we? Social media connects us all together so well. I, I have usually once if not twice a week, I have Skype calls with, with friends in Japan and, and friends locally, and we share and we hold each other accountable. But Skype is, is not enough. It's good, it's great, but it's not enough. Sometimes you just want the presence of that person next to you. C.S. Lewis, in, in his, his book Grief Observed, when his wife had passed away, one of the things he says that he missed the most was the presence of his wife physically not being there. When God gave his son, he gave his presence. We begin to see who God is. And our time and presence are what people need. And this is not a new concept, but it's perhaps a neglected one. To give you an example of a gift that shares presence, a son and a father were exchanging gifts, and the son gave to the father a bag of coffee. And dad was like, a bag of coffee? I could get that at Morrison's. He said, well, the deal with this coffee bag is you're only allowed to drink it with me. And so over the course of the next six months, whenever son and dad got together, they opened the bag and they shared a cup of coffee together. And they shared their stories, and they conversed, and they were just together. And it was one of the most personal gifts that Dad ever received. So God gave his presence, and we're called to give our presence too. Secondly, the gift of Jesus was personal. Luke 2 verse 11 says, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. Jesus came for you. The gift was personal. But when you look at his life, you see that he invested in people. He cared. He paid attention. He grew deep friendships. Not many friendships, but perhaps with the 12 and maybe a few more outside of the 12, deep friendships that he invested in. And he was never in a hurry. How many times have you bought a gift for someone that you know you need to... How many of you... And I'm not going to be stereotypical here, but probably you men. How many of you have gone to the garage the night before a birthday or Christmas and you've bought garage flowers and you think that they won't find out? Generic gifts that require no thought are a waste of time. They are a waste of time because... It's the thought that counts. And if you've not put any thought into it, it's worse than awful. But the truth is, we've given them, and we've received them, and we've forgotten them. And that's not what we want. The gifts that we give can be a real witness of our faith in Jesus Christ. About paying attention, about thinking about the person who we're giving to, and what they care about. To give another example, a father gave his daughter at Christmas time two empty journals. And her face was like, like garage flowers. Two empty journals. What's this all about? And dad said, well, you take one, I'll take the other. She was going off to university. And for every week, write in your journal. And for that week you're away, I will write in the journal. And we'll exchange them next Christmas. And so they had 52 entries and they shared them the next Christmas. And they said that was the most wonderful gift they ever had. 
The gift of Jesus was personal. God gave his presence. But also his gift was costly. Philippians 2 verse 7. Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. When you think about it, the incarnation could have happened in the palaces. God coming to the earth as, as a king, presumably he would come to the, the oi polloi, the, the wealthy, the ones who had it all. And yet God comes to mom and dad who are poor in a manky stable. His gift was costly. Through humility and servanthood, it led to the cross. Mark 10 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The gift of God cost God everything. The Father and the Son. The Father's heartbreak as the Son went to the cross. The Son's heartbreak in Gethsemane. The gift was costly. So what am I saying? Am I saying that your gifts are going to cost everything? Probably not. But maybe, maybe they should pinch a little. The gifts that we give should maybe cost our time and our energy. It's all about the relational giving. And if people see the gifts we give drip with grace, they will be pointed to Jesus. We have a loved one here, Val, who, who can't get to church anymore. But Val, as she is in the nursing home for her 75th birthday, I think it was her 75th birthday, she received a book. And in the book was pictures of all the people that she loved. And when she received the book, there was a huge smile on her face. And that gift took a lot of time and a lot of effort for the person who did it. But that gift has made a huge difference for Val in her, in her life now in the home. God's gift cost, but God's gift also bridged the gap. It restores us with the Father. It brings us near. How do we give to those that maybe we don't spend every day with? Well, a wee example. Granny got a jar at Christmas with some bits of paper in it. And it was from her grandkids. And the grandkids had written 52 little notes in this jar. And they said to Gran, Gran, Monday morning, you open that jar, you take one of those stories out, and you read it, and think of us as we're on the other side of the country. And Gran, every Monday morning, would read this story, a different story every week, about how she'd spent time with her grandkids. And by the end of the year, she said, Mondays are the best day of the week. We can give in amazing ways that can make a difference. We can give because of he who gave his life for us. We have the dream of a Messiah who sets life aright. The one who opens the way to abundant joy and peace and hope and life. We want to keep that dream alive. We can conspire this advent to recognize that something radically new is unfolding and that you and I have significant roles to play in that story. So let's stop giving easy gifts. Let's give relational gifts that echo what God has done for us in Jesus by giving our presence, by being personal, by, by paying the price and bringing us together because that will make a difference. Because as we celebrate Christmas differently, others will hear the good news loud and clear. And that really is something to celebrate. We want to make a difference as church. We want to make a difference locally, nationally, and across the world. And one of the charities we're going to give to this year is Open Doors, who help the persecuted Christians. So we're going to watch a short video now that tells you a little about 
a little bit about the work that they're doing across the world. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we can make a difference. Lord, help us to make a difference. To pray for those in need. To give even when it hurts. Because we know there are so many going through such horrendous things. So Father, I pray that you impact each one of us with your good news afresh today. And as you fill us up with that love and that peace you have for us, Lord, may we not forget those in need. And we pray especially for those persecuted Christians across the world who meet today with great risk, with great trepidation, with great faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue to worship.